could I introduce Anthony Impey, I'm the CEO of Be The Business. Anthony's a serial entrepreneur, experienced business, business leader. He has a wealth of experience in starting, building and operating businesses and not-for-profit organizations um, in the tech and skills sectors. He's chair of the Federation of Small Business New Policy Think Tank and the UK's Government Apprenticeship Stakeholder Board and the Mayor of London's Apprenticeship Advisory Group and works closely with us here um, at City and Guilds and ILM. So um, welcome, Anthony. Great to have you here. Thank you, Nick. I'd also like to introduce Nikki Taylor. So Nikki Taylor um, has built her career in the agri-food industry. She currently heads up the talent and employee experience across Moy Park. And Moy Park is one of our top food companies, Northern Ireland's largest private sector business and one of Europe's leading poultry producers. And I know Nikki has got some interesting um, things to say around uh, purpose um, that, that has come out of uh, COVID. So welcome, Nikki. And then um, Professor Carol Jarvis. Carol is Professor in the Knowledge and Exchange um, and Innovation at Bristol Business School. She plays an active role in the design and delivery of leadership development programmes. And uh, one of the things that we're going to be talking today is about a, a recently um, co-authored chapter that she has written um, entitled Unleadership, which is in Martin Parker's uh, forthcoming book, Life After COVID-19. And this is where we're going to kick off the conversation. So, Carol, unleadership. Um, what brought you and your colleagues to write about unleadership and, and, and what does the term unleadership actually mean? Um, thanks. Well, I think it's like so many ideas and innovations. Um, our chapter on unleadership, it kind of emerged from the margins of a different conversation that I was having with my colleagues, Hugo Gagiotti and Selen Cars. Um, we were actually researching the development of entrepreneurial mindsets. And then when COVID hit, um, what we started to notice was that whilst many political leaders and others in senior leadership roles were kind of dithering and delaying, um, weighing up the, the evidence and centralising and, and trying to be in control, at a more local level, there were a lot of individuals, companies and communities that were actually picking up that leadership mantle um, and they were using their resourcefulness and whatever resources they had available to them to actually take timely and often very creative and informed action um, for social good. And when we uncovered that a bit further, what we discovered was a, a set of practices that we called unleadership. Um, and that sort of described, I guess, the spontaneous, uncontrolled actions and initiatives that have really come to the fore. Um, I guess they were probably there before, but in COVID-19, we've just they've really surfaced and some of the main characteristics i think it was having the courage to act into the unknown um, with a clear sense of purpose but without a grand plan and um, being willing to admit to not knowing quite how things were going to work out but that you know it was done in a good spirit um, and that spirit was compassion generosity um, working for the social good and without necessarily any kind of idea that there might be a personal benefit to doing it. We also saw unleaders taking really timely and thoughtful action. They were acting in the here and now on the basis of the insight and the information that was available to them without aiming to predict the future. Um, and most importantly, perhaps taking responsibility, not waiting for permission or for the authority to be delegated. Um, so just willing and willing to pass that responsibility on to others or involve other people when they reach their limits. So if there was somebody else who was better able to take control, then they, they handed it over. Um, and we described it as unleadership because whilst these are all very leaderly practices, um, unleaders don't generally seek out followers. So and they don't define what they're doing, their acts, in relation to the dominant leadership narratives. That's very much, isn't it, what we're talking about here, which is that sort of traditional notion of leadership being turned on its head. They're not these traditional, I'm in charge, I'm going to take control, I'm going to head towards this state of perfection. It's actually the opposite, but it was, you know, really effective leadership. 
Yeah, and, and I think by not seeking that sort of state of perfection, but going for something that's good enough, you're actually more closely, more likely to get to something that is closer to perfection and certainly taking you where you want to do it. Excellent, excellent. That's interesting. Nikki, I mean, how does that chime with your experiences of kind of unexpected leadership during during the pandemic? Yeah, I think it resonates really well. And thanks, Nick and, and Carol. Um, I think particularly uh, I'll pick up on um, the piece around actually what's sometimes good enough rather than perfect. And I think what we've seen is what good enough, what's good enough allows you to operate with pace. And actually what people want right now is pace and you know decisions and some certainty around what's going on. So I think we've seen lots of that happening. We've certainly seen a lot more humility come through um, and humility and, and people values that I think are really important to people right now, they are certainly coming to the forefront. And I think as a result of that, we've seen a lot of the, what you would call unleadership and, and people that are in non-leadership roles really beginning to, um, to, to step up and feel that they can influence what happens, that they can have a say, and I think a lot of it is born from people wanting to do the right thing for their colleagues and their team members. And that really starts to shift how things operate and how things feel. And it's enabling people that they feel they can make a difference. It doesn't matter what role they do. But, but through that has come some huge innovation from people thinking differently. What they, you know, how can I help this person? What can I do? How can I give assurance? And that's certainly driven some fantastic examples of, you know, people that would come forward that wouldn't necessarily have had the confidence um, or necessarily have wanted to, um, to to do that. And I think we've seen some fantastic examples of where, you know, people have stepped in and said, I, I, I work in a finance role, but what's going on is unprecedented. I would like to create a time capsule for my colleagues, you know, little things that you would never have normally seen come forward. So there's been a huge amount of innovation. I think we've seen discretionary effort appearing in lots of different ways and more about discretionary effort to be connected with the organisation. It's about that driving the impact in the way that we work together and that we work with our colleagues as well. Yeah, excellent. I mean, really interesting stuff there. And Anthony, just from, from your point of view, having listened to Carol and, and Nikki, where, where do you come in on the unleadership um, kind of piece? Well, I mean, I think I, I think it's really interesting leading, reading the unleadership report, uh, the unleadership paper that um, Carol and her colleagues have uh, written. And, and really interesting, Carol, I think that, you know, you were saying that you were doing research around the entrepreneurial mindset before embarking on, on the on the unleadership piece, because I think you know when, when you look at um, some of the features that you describe and the characteristics of this new um, version of leadership that we're seeing coming out of COVID, I think we are seeing entrepreneurs emerging. You know, because because entrepreneurs are very very used to operating in environments of extreme uncertainty. It's you know it's our it's the it's the environment in which we we thrive in and operate and it's it's what entrepreneurs look for when they are wanting to build an organization and and i think covid has created uh, this huge challenge that uh, demands people demands that people step up to to it and kind of um not necessarily ask for permission or to um, you know, seek uh, authority to do something, they're kind of saying this is a big challenge and we need to respond to it and we're going to use all the resources that we have available to, to do our part in, in this challenge. You know, and I, I think it's interesting, I, I, you know, Carol, you talk about, you know, there's lots of, you know, um, traditional leaders talk about kind of wartime conditions and, you know, how they're kind of trying to rally people around around you know this theme of you know the, these are you know these are times that are equivalent to um war and you know i i i i, I struggle when people say that because you know we, we don't have the extreme hardships of war or, or 
you know, I, I, you know, I, I think it's important just to kind of make that point. But at the same time, I think it does, you know, COVID has, and the crisis has created this unifying challenge that people want to step up to and respond to. So I think that's, you know, really um, important. And I see that time and time again with lots of the organizations that, that uh, I work with is that actually um, the pandemic has created something that they're, they're, they themselves and their teams around them have responded to and are doing lots and lots of things in order to respond to the challenge. I think it's worth just kind of reflecting also some, some research that um, we did at Be The Business uh, kind of a couple of months into into the crisis and we found that um, businesses could be categorized into three different types of business in terms of their response to the challenge so the first type um, were innovators so these were people that said okay the world has changed uh, and uh, it's created all these challenges but it's also produced lots of opportunities and so we're going to change how our business operates and so at one end of the scale you had um, big companies like McLaren making ventilators for the NHS. And at the other end, you had, um, you know, my, my local coffee shop uh, just up the road on Essex Road, uh, turn themselves into a little grocery store. So they're selling coffee and, and selling groceries because, you know, shops were running out of pasta and, and um, uh, things like that. So, so you know, there, there were that group of companies that were innovators and about a third of businesses fell into that category. There's a further third of businesses that fall into uh, the undecided category, who and, and these are organisations that are um, uh, that recognise that they need to do something, but they're just holding on. They're just they're just waiting until until you know things start to settle down before they make a change. But they recognise that they have to make a change. Um, and then there's a third group who are the stickers who are just saying, well, actually, we're just going to wait. I'm going to wait until things come back to normal. <clears throat> and I think it's worth kind of thinking about those three different categories in this context of leadership, because I think that how organisations respond, respond is often, uh, a, is often um, a reflection of how, uh, how the organisation's leadership responds to the crisis. Um, and so, so I, did, I just want to kind of leave those kind of three categories as, a, as, a, as another reference point to, to this discussion around our leadership. That, that's really interesting. Thanks, Anthony. So, so you know, a real opportunity for people who may not have been entrepreneurs before to actually be entrepreneurial in this situation, which I think is really interesting. And I, I thought you might say that. Um, but also this idea of these these three types of organisations. And Carol, I think that's quite a nice link into, you know, um, back into unleadership because you mentioned in your article about, um, sorry, your chapter about sort of one of the reasons why unleaders came out was because of indecision, wasn't it? You know, they, you know, there's a lot of dithering going on, and so people going, right, I'm going to fill that void. But just what is it then that makes unleaders different? What's different about them? Um, I think that's really important to think about because I guess I would put them into that innovators section, um, and linked to that, I mean, I, I would, I would imagine that most of those organisations that fit into that innovators category know what they're about. So they, they are focusing on their purpose. And I think that's something that's very different about um, leaders. Hopefully, I mean, actually, um, Nikki gave some really good examples from Moy Park and her experience of the way that that's happening in more established organisations too. So I don't think this has to be something that is, but it's that that notion of an on, a more entrepreneurial, innovative approach that I think is typically driven by by purpose. Um, I also think that there's something about and leaders that, in an organisational context, we may be looking at keeping social good. Um, and that includes being an inclusive leader. Um, so fostering a climate where everyone can thrive and that recognises that the development of others is a core leadership responsibility. I think that's something that's that's really important. Um, I think it's also something about thinking differently about how we plan. So not abandoning planning but not expecting everything to go to plan 
and blaming others when the plan doesn't kind of work out as it was supposed to. So instead, that notion about taking timely and thoughtful actions, um, but they have to be noticed. So I think that's something else for me in a, in a in an organisational context. Um, I was really struck by um, Nikki's comment that you know people come forward, but we have to recognise that they're coming forward and pay attention to what it is they're doing. Um, so fostering and rewarding those kind of behaviours and practices that are made for the common organisational good rather than the individual's benefit. So that would that would include for me a lot of the things that typically do go unnoticed, those invisible kind of glue work that really makes the organisation tick. Um, and I think there's something too about recognising that unleadership is developed, it's an appreciative process and it's developed through practice, it can't be taught. So maybe thinking differently about how how we develop those kind of capacities. Um, so some of the things that we use, for example, is we might take people on reflective walks, we might get them drawing, we might get them doing things. I mean, I love that idea of the the time capsule for colleagues to remember back. So those kind of those creative but thoughtful acts that kind of recognise people and that maybe through doing that, what we're doing is trying to develop leaders who contribute to making our workplaces more kind of appreciate, appreciative, compassionate and more just more human places to to be in. And I think if we do that, then the profits will follow. And there's some good work by an economist called John Kay that does kind of look at, you know, when you when you put that focus on purpose and people, that the profit can often follow behind because people just want to be part of your organization. Yeah, I mean, I, we mustn't forget that at the end of the day, we've got to keep more organizations going. Exactly. And we do, <laughs> we do have, to, have to keep making the money, um, otherwise we won't be here. Brilliant, thanks, that's that's great. Thanks, Carolyn. And, and, and when we kind of got together for our first chat, we talked a little bit about, didn't we, you know, about that idea that we might default back into old leadership behaviours. Let, let's, not, let's not lose the momentum here. And Nikki, just interested to know in terms of your strategy in, at Moy Park, your leadership strategy, what changes you might make to avoid, um, or maybe more positively, what you might do to kind of encourage the ongoing unleadership stuff that you've seen happening in your organisation? Mm. Yeah, and, and I think it, it, it's been a really um, rich learning experience for leadership across the organisation. I think some key things for us is, is really knowing it's the little things that really make the difference. So we want to continue to, to foster that spirit of peer recognition um, and recognition right across the organisation. So we have stepped into and, you know, committed to formalising that into a recognition programme, which is about continuing to recognise those areas around, you know, people de demonstrating great humility, people stepping in and taking ownership. So that's something that we think is really going to cement that in and allow us to continue that as we go forward. I think another piece of learning has been um, how do we create certainty in what is an uncertain world for a lot of people? So um, the, the piece around actually stepping in um, and sometimes, you know, you have to step in and, and, and make some decisions and, you know, be concerned about some of the impact on our decisions after if it's the right thing to do for our people. So I think that that's been really key. And, and I know we've talked a lot about purpose. Um, and I think what we've really worked hard to do is to, to bring the human connection into purpose. And I think a lot of times when we talk in business, it's about why are we doing this? It's about, you know, for the benefit of our customers. Um, you know, that's often the thing that we hear. But actually, we've stepped into thinking more about what's the real human impact here? And why are we doing this? And what is the impact on the people around us in our organisation? Because ultimately, if, if, if nobody shows up, we don't operate. So it's really gone to show um, just how important that is. 
And I think the other key piece of learning that we have that we want to continue is communication and that connectiveness with teams. And everybody at the start of COVID stepped in to say, we're never going to continue to foster our, our team working or our team spirit. And actually what we're seeing is that's become stronger than ever because it's encouraged teams to meet more often, meet, you know, meet in different ways. Um, you know, people have had to step into a virtual world. And for a lot of people, you know, that was quite a big leap and things that people weren't comfortable with. So it's using those mediums to, to do things that are practical and draw the teams together. And, you know, just to quote a really simple example, um, some of the shared learning that's gone on is everybody, as they've learned to use Teams, realizes you can put a photo behind you. That people now, every meeting, they put a different picture about something of their life or something going on. And they talk about that. And those sorts of things would just never have happened with that frequency if we were not in the situation that we are in now. That's really brilliant. Thank you. Sort of an ir irony of this is the connectedness that's come out of not being connected in the way we normally are. I mean, Anthony, yes. are we? Is this the start of us getting leadership right? I mean, great, great question. And and you know, I think you know, I'm just reflecting on on the things that Nikki and Carol have said, and and they do point towards very, very different ways of working. And and I think you know, if you were to characterise the environment that we are in now. It is one of massive uncertainty and rapid change. And, and, and they create conditions which, you know, the old ways of working didn't really, didn't really work. When I, there's something uh, you said, Carol, about, um, you know, we've got to think differently about planning. And it reminded me of the great Mike Tyson quote of everyone has a plan until they're punched in the face. And it's, I, and, and I was just, I hadn't thought of it before, but that's kind of what COVID has done. And that's the challenge that leaders have got. And maybe why, you know, many of our leaders that we have at the moment are really, really struggling because the way of the, the way that they've been working, which has kind of been good time leadership, you know, and, and, and it's always, you know, work, operating any kind of organisation is always easier in the good times than in the tough times. You know, suddenly they've, they've had that Mike Tyson moment and 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 they don't know what to do because all the tools that they had are not working anymore. And 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 so and and what is happening and what is really positive is that you're seeing new new um, new unleaders emerging, new organisations emerging. I, I mean, I think this is a time of massive massive change. You know, this is a, a tectonic shift in how organisations operate. And and so I think that. That while I acknowledge that the crisis is is really tough, and I'm not taking that away from from you know those business owners that are struggling to keep their businesses afloat, or those people that find themselves unemployed, you know it is unbelievably tough. But at the same time, there is massive opportunity that the crisis is cre creating because all the old rules that everybody worked to no longer work, and new rules are now being created and and i think at the very essence you know at, at, at its very essence that's what our leadership is about so yes this is this is a this is a whole new time we will look back uh, on this time in 20 years time and say actually this was a pivotal pivotal time 2020 was a pivotal time when we thought when, when leadership changed and it changed forever yeah, I mean, I I agree. I mean, I, I can feel it in my in my in my leadership bones. You know, it's been an uncomfortable time, and 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 you know, it has you know, tipped a lot of things on 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 their head, and and you know that that has been has been tricky. I'd really like to just um kind of get to some questions after that wonderful discussion. Really interesting. And there's one um Carol that's come in, which is about decision making, um and. Um, the question is, Carol, do you think this embraces a whole organisation, department and departmental collaboration when making decisions? Yes, I think it I think it has to. I think it has to be something about um, thinking differently about the silos sorry i'm hearing a lot of pinging going on at the moment um yeah we have to we have to think differently about how we work together and that that idea about um 
you know, being willing to maybe rather than saying this is my role and therefore I'm going to be the person who does X, Y, Z, that that we we start to think differently about who is the best person to do this and how can we collaborate differently in everybody's best interest. So there's that that thing maybe just about being more flexible, being more open, um, being Co being more co-creative rather than focusing very much on what's in this for me how, how can I make the best contribution to my team my community so yeah great thank you any of the other panelists wanted to come in on that one I mean I, I think it's 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 very much um, you know organizations have to have to rethink how they how they are structured and leadership needs to be turned upside down and, and the people you know full autonomy as far as possible needs to be given to people throughout the organization you know there was a big big concern about working from home that um the, the reason why that why the reason why working from home was not more widespread before covid was because lots of research and lots of thinking was you know, working from home will never work because the moment people stay at home, they're going to stay in their pajamas. They won't switch on their computer. You know, they'll spend their time playing computer games. They just won't. I mean, that's not, by the way, what I do in my life. It just, I'm just, I'm, there was a concern that that's what people would do, and that actually, if you let people work from home, there'd be a massive fall off in productivity. And what's happened? You know, we've had circumstances forced on ourselves where large numbers of the population have to work from home and productivity has increased as a result. Because actually when people work from home and they're given that autonomy and that responsibility to have leadership over their own workflows, yes, they might stay in their pyjamas all day, but they might be working from 6 a.m. till 9 p.m. at night because actually that's what they want to do. And I, and I so, I so I think this is this is. You know, this is not about, you know, how far do you push down autonomy? This is about, you know, actually start with autonomy at the, throughout the organisation. That's now the default setting that organisations can, can work to. And that doesn't necessarily work for all environments. Some environments need some, some structure because the nature of the working environment, construction, manufacturing, there, there requires some sort of um, structure in order to create productive operations. But as far as possible, people... There is a small minority that will take them take the um, take advantage of the circumstances, but the vast majority want to do great work, and so I think I think it comes down to the individual. Great, thank you, um, Nikki. One one question we had submitted um, before the webinar, and thank you to those of you that that submitted questions to us prior prior to the webinar. There's one about um, aside from resilience, what other leadership styles do you see as essential for the future, and how do we develop them? Now, I think in a way we've been talking about unleadership qualities as being some of those leadership qualities. But I mean, how how are you reflecting on that? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. And we have spent quite a bit of time um, actually starting to reshape our leadership development offer. And that's really starting to put core values at the heart of leadership. So I know we've talked before around sort of the, the humility, but but actually, when you lead with sincerity, where does that take you? What does that give you? So making those, that sort of values driven leadership really at the heart of what we do is, is really key. There are other, um, you know, other areas around determination and actually leadership determination is, is really key. And I think is really beginning to come in, you know, in its own. And that's not about, you know, putting the, 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 the superwoman or superman cape on. It's about really. Um, you know, thinking hard to find a way through to come to something that benefits the people within the organisation. So I, th so I think, and Anthony was talking about it, it's turning leadership on its head. It, it absolutely is. And when you, I think, start to then look at how you drive leadership behaviours, how you recognise and reinforce leadership behaviours is the other core thing that has to change because what's worked or what perhaps has been perceived as traditional is not what we need right now and is not what we need to build in the future. Absolutely. I mean, I've just been, I've been sat here thinking about, you know, everything that everyone's been saying and, and Anthony's, you don't 
don't you have a plan until you're punched in the face well it's a bit it's been a bit that way for leaders as well you know we've all been busy building our leadership skills working on our you know going on our webinars and learning all this stuff but then the punch in the face was a completely unprecedented situation and certainly from a very personal point of view you know it, it really has challenged some of the you know very visceral kind of um integral ideas that i had about leadership and you know having to you know at times kind of work from the bottom up again and, and and that's certainly been really challenging a really interesting comment here in the um questions from susan uh Faye. thanks susan it seems to me like your your um what you're doing is kind of distinguishing between between leadership and management you know management is mistaken for leadership but in times of crisis this is when leadership comes into its own and i think i think we could say in times of crisis unleadership came into its own as well can't we i think and i think i think that's kind of what we're saying is that in the time of crisis this this crisis traditional leadership kind of didn't come into its own but unleaders came into their own so i think that's a really really interesting comment um <clears throat> so um i just I, I want to think about young people a little bit here because uh, you know ilm we we're often interested in leadership at all levels and i think that that chimes with unleadership but what about young leaders i mean how how do we you know think about unleadership in 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 regards to to young people certainly there are some very um well-known examples of people who you know young people who have gone entrepreneurial um at this point in time so maybe anthony maybe start with you on on young young leaders and what this means for them yeah i mean you know it's it, you know it, I, I just i feel like I'm, I'm just quoting people one after the other but you know it is the best of times and worst of times at the moment i think if you're a young person so you know without a shadow of a doubt uh, if you are coming out of the education system at the moment and looking for employment it is really really tough and, it, and it's tough because you know there are so many more people and there will be so many more people joining the work for uh, joining the unemployment ranks looking for work and so regrettably it's going to be become tougher than uh, sooner uh, it's going to become tougher before it gets better so so you know I, I think that is that is why it is extremely hard for young people at the moment because the traditional all all work is is the traditional work that lots of young people did has, has disappeared and, and is likely to, to stay away for for the foreseeable future. At the same time, young people are have grown up with technology and they have grown up with a entrepreneurial spirit and an entrepreneurial environment that did not exist 25 years ago. 25 years ago, when um, I left university, I know lots of shock. That I'm that old, um, but um, when I, you know when I said I wanted to be an entrepreneur, it was like, well, you know, that's a that's a real scummy career to do. You know, nobody becomes an entrepreneur. You know, the only thing to work, uh, you know, there was nothing on television about being an entrepreneur. It was just like a, you know, it was just not. It was it wasn't a real job, uh, and and yet now, you know, being an entrepreneur is something that people aspire to and people want to be uh, an entrepreneur. So. Uh, so, so young people are, have grown up uh, and are very familiar with the technology and an environment that encourages entrepreneurship. So, so they are very well equipped to take advantage of of this environment where technology and you know agile thinking and innovative approach to uh, the environment in which you operate uh, they, they are the things that are that are re really valued. So. It, without a shadow of a doubt, it, it is difficult, but I think there is also opportunities that young people have um, today that, that they certainly didn't have um, 10, 20 years ago. Great, thanks, Anthony. Um, I'm just we, we've got one from earlier on, and I, I think it, uh, it's worth picking up. It's, it's um, from Amma. Thanks, Amma. What's discretionary effort? And I think that actually that is relevant when we're talking about unleadership, isn't it? Obviously, discretionary effort is that you know the effort you you know you put in willingly that's not expected of you. But in terms of unleadership, how does discretionary effort fit, Carol? I, I think I noticed Nikki talked a lot about discretionary effort, and I I think it is that sense of doing something because it's the right thing to do and because it needs to be 
done and not necessarily expecting to get any um, immediate reward for doing it. So I, one of the terms that gets used in um, a lot of the entrepreneurship literature is this notion of paying it forward. So if if I do the right thing, good good things will happen. And linking into the last question, it's something, I mean, one of the privileges of working in a university and working with a lot of young people um, is that it's something I've really observed in this generation of younger people now, is this kind of real sense of wanting to contribute and feeling able to contribute. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it fits I mean, and leadership is all about discretionary effort. Nobody's asked these people to do things. They've just used their initiative. They've used their resources and their resourcefulness, and they've gone and they've gone and done it. And I think, as um, as Anthony was saying, you know, it is something I observe a lot in young people. This more kind of um, entrepreneurial approach um, to to life and to paying it forward and doing good things. Wonderful. I, mean, I, think, I think that's a fantastic note to unfortunately have to end on because we are coming up to coming up to um, 20 to 11. I, I could sit and talk about this um, all day, I think. It's just been absolutely fascinating. I, I'm, and I'm sure the conversation will carry on in different ways, whether that be through social media um, or through through people connecting in, in, in all the different ways that we do. I just want to say a huge thank you, Carol, Nikki and Anthony. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for your contributions. We also had Martin with us before who couldn't unfortunately join us today but thanks to Martin if you're on the line. Um, the session is recorded. Um, there were another of another, a number of questions that were submitted which relate to qualification arrangements um, and assessment arrangements and that kind of thing. If you've got those kind of questions I would say just keep an eye on our website but also you may want to contact me directly um, if you've got specific questions and I will signpost those um, accordingly to other people within the organisation. So don't, don't hesitate to, to get in touch. Um, and uh, that just leaves me to say a massive thank you um, to everybody. Hope you enjoyed the webinar um, and we will hopefully see you again um, in the not too distant future. Thank you very much indeed and uh, stay safe and stay well. Thank you.